Hi there ladies and gentlemen, this is your screencast for organic chemistry on proteins. Particularly, we would call this organic chemistry screencast 5. As you begin viewing the screencast, please make sure that you have some notes, uh, or paper to take notes, that is. Um, make sure that you're writing down all key terms, write down explanations and definitions of those key terms, and write down pictures or draw diagrams uh, as well. So let's get started. This uh, presentation starts on um, slide 43, so let's get to it. So here's your title slide, Organic Chemistry Screencast Segment 5 on Proteins. All right, <clears throat> as you can see from that first line here, protein uh, is the most abundant and diverse type of molecule found in living cells of organisms. And what one thing you're going to need to do here is recognize all these different types of organic molecules. So let's talk about how to recognize what a protein is. First, you should know what elements are found in proteins. That's going to be carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Sometimes you'll see sulfur in protein, but you won't always see it, depending on what level of complexity of the diagram you're looking at is. Two functional groups that you're going to be recognizing when you look at specifically the monomer, the building block unit molecules of proteins, and that'll be carboxyl groups and amino groups. So you need to know what those particular functional groups look like. You need to know that the monomers of proteins are called amino acids. And what we're going to talk about here is how amino acids get linked up together and how the order of amino acids uh, really matters, like which amino acids are put together in what order. When we uh, uh, talk about how amino acids are linked together, when they are linked together, we describe them as what we call polypeptides. What you're looking at over here on the left side of this uh, slide is the four levels of structure that we talk about when we talk about the organization of protein molecules. But before we get into that level, those four levels of structure, let's talk about the specifics of the monos, uh, excuse me, not monosaccharides, the monomers of uh, proteins, which of course are amino acids. If you haven't already, write this down, okay? Draw this structure. Now when you look at this, you have a uh, key here, all right? There are really four main parts to uh, any amino acid. Uh, this pink area here is the amino functional group. This blue area here is the carboxyl functional group. What doesn't have any color is just the background color here is the central carbon and the hydrogen. Notice how the amino group is linked to that central carbon and that central carbon is also linked to that carboxyl. And this R means, well, a way that you can think about it is the rest of the molecule. There is no capital R in the periodic table. Go ahead, search your periodic table. You're not going to find an element that uh, has the symbol of just R. So that is called the side group, or sometimes the R group, as it is known. And all amino acids have this amino, the central carbon and the carboxyl, but what makes one amino acid different from any other amino acid is what's here in this R group. And it's variable. So what does that mean? Well, it means that there's 20 different possibilities for what could be in that R group area. Please realize that the amino acid, this is the amino, this is the carboxyl. Carboxyls can be acting as acids, so we call it a, this an amino acid. This is showing the amino on the left and the carboxyl on the right you can show it the other way around. So, I mean, for example, if you look at my hand, this is my, this is my left hand, but if I turn my hand around, it's still my left hand. You're just seeing it in a different place. All right? You're seeing it oriented here. My fingers over, are over here, and now my fingers are over here. It's still my right hand. You gotta think about how amino acids, this structure could be flipped around when you're looking at diagrams. <coughs> uh, 
The, on, the only other thing to consider about the structure of amino acid is that this central carbon is also always bonded to a hydrogen. So here on this list are your list of structures found in an amino acid. Now, this diagram shows you not all of the 20 different possibilities, um, but a few of the different ways in which the R groups, or the side chains as they are called, look. So I'm going to zoom in here. And, and I know it's getting fuzzy, but this structure is a very simple amino acid called alanine. And it's not showing everything. This is part of the amino group right there. And, whoa, what happened here? Let's back out. Oh, boy. So this is the amino group. Here's part of the carboxyl group. But what's shown here this is what makes alanine alanine. The R group just is a carbon with three hydrogens. So that's what makes alanine alanine. How does alanine, that amino acid, vary from another amino acid? Well, this is how. Here's valine. Notice we still have an amino here, or part of it, as it's shown. And here's the carboxyl, or part of it, as it's shown. Do you see how this is different? this side chain is different from this side chain so that's what makes alanine different from valine well here's another here's leucine oops <laughs> sorry leucine has this arrangement of carbon and hydrogens that's what makes leucine leucine well, anyway, you get the picture. You can look through all of these different types of amino acids and see how the R groups is what makes them different from one another. Are you going to need to memorize all 20 of these different amino acids and their structures? Absolutely not. Save that for your molecular biology class when you get to your junior year in college when you're a biology major, but not as a freshman in high school, okay? Let's talk about how these different amino acids can be linked together. Now in this diagram, um, here we have an amino, and this is the amino group in its charged form. It has accepted an additional proton, hydrogen ion. This is showing the carboxyl with uh, a hydrogen that has been donated to solution, or it's gone. So it's showing an O minus instead of OH here. So recognize that this is the amino, this is the carboxyl, here's our central carbon, here's that hydrogen bonded to that central carbon, and here's R. Now this diagram dig shows this R as R1, and do you see how this is another amino acid? Because it's showing R2. <coughs> now look at what's circled in red here. See these two hydrogens and this oxygen? Do you see how those three atoms could be linked together to form a water molecule? And if these two hydrogens go away and this oxygen goes away, what ends up happening is that this carbon is going to need another bond, and so too will this nitrogen. So what happens is the carbon from this carboxyl of this amino acid will link with this nitrogen in the amino group of the second amino acid. And the result is what we have is a peptide bond. We call this a peptide bond. It's a bond between the carbon, which was the carbon from the carboxyl and the nitrogen which was a nitrogen from the amino and now we have this amino acid amino acid one linked chemically to this amino acid and if that happens over and over and over again you get a big long chain of amino acids what you're seeing right here are two amino acids linked together and we actually call that a dipeptide here's the term right here dipeptide di is the prefix of course that means two Here's another look at it. <clears throat> what you see up here are four separate amino acids. And the way in which they vary from one another is what's in their R groups, or their side chains, as it is called. This is methionine. And the reason why methionine is, me is methionine is because it has this carbon with these two hydrogens, this carbon with these two hydrogens, a sulfur, and this methyl group, this C with this three hydrogens. That's what makes methionine methionine. What makes it aspartic acid aspartic acid is this arrangement of this R group. 
Here's leucine. I mentioned leucine earlier. And now here's tyrosine. Remember, these random-looking polygons or stop sign-looking things aren't just random polygons and stop signs. This is skeletal organic chemistry uh, formula, and what you see here is that at every bend, well, what you don't see, rather, is that at every bend, there is a carbon implied. What's also implied is enough hydrogen here so that each carbon is making four bonds total, um, as is needed. So if we look at these four amino acids, they're separate. They each have an amino and a carboxyl. Here's another amino and a carboxyl. Here it is again, amino group, carboxyl. And the last one here, here's an amino group and a carboxyl. And what happens is water is made, so that's dehydration synthesis, and the carbon is linked to the nitrogen of the next amino acid. And the nitrogen of this amino acid is linked to the carbon of that amino acid, and so on. So what we have here are four now linked amino acids, and three peptide bonds that link those four amino acids together. What you're going to notice is on one end of a polypeptide, as we call it, you'll see the amino end or the amino terminus, and at the other end, that's our carboxyl group, sometimes called the carboxyl terminus or C terminus. This word terminus just means end, okay? <clears throat> so let's talk about now uh, the levels of organization of a polypeptide. When we talk about the primary or the first level of structure of a polypeptide, what we're really talking about is which amino acids are linked up and in what order are they linked up. So the fancy way to describe that is sequence of amino acids. Now, it's your genes, it's your DNA, how that's decoded and translated, that determines that particular order. The primary structure is everything to a polypeptide and eventually the functional protein. Because how the amino acids are linked together and in what order they're linked together is going to determine how it folds up on itself into a secondary structure and how it folds up again on itself on the next level of complexity into the tertiary structure and whether or not a tertiary protein structure can interact with another tertiary protein structure or a few other per tertiary protein structures to form what we call the quaternary protein structure. The shape of a protein is everything to how well it, or well it, uh, how well it functions or uh, whether or not it does not function. <clears throat> so let's go through this again. The primary structure is really just the sequence of the amino acids, so which amino acids and in what order. The secondary structure occurs when you get amino acids that aren't linked together by peptide bonds, but uh, not necessarily from one amino acid to the next amino acid, but maybe, say, the third amino acid in the chain is attracted via hydrogen bonding to the seventh amino acid in the chain. And so what happens is the whole sequence of polypeptide bends down and attracts to itself and folds into a certain shape. Two ways it can fold up is uh, into what we call a pleated sheet or an alpha helix. And when these pleated sheets and alpha helices interact with each other at the next level of organization, we get our tertiary structure. The tertiary structure is really what ends up being this glob of protein that has a three-dimensional structure. And if one glob of tertiary protein interacts with another glob of protein, we get that quaternary structure. Here's another look at it. So again, primary structure is what amino acids are linked together in what order. Okay, So if these little blue spheres or these little blue circles represent individual amino acids and the lines in between them would represent peptide bonds, what I want you to imagine is how one amino acid down here might have a polar side chain and this amino acid down here could have a polar side chain. And so what happens is this amino acid could be attracted to this amino acid here and the whole bead of amino acids could fold up on itself or maybe spiral down on itself. Do you see these red dots here? These red dots here indicate hydrogen bonding. Do you remember hydrogen bonding from 
when we talked about how water molecules interact with one another. This is the same type of, uh, uh, not within the molecule, but between different molecules, interaction or attraction. See this little hydrogen area here? And here's an oxygen area here. This would has have a partial positive charge right here, and this would have a partial negative charge right here. Here's an oxygen, and here's a hydrogen. This might have a partial negative area charge, and this would have a partial positive charge. And so what happens is this amino acid here is attracted to this amino acid here. Now, they're not bonded right next to one another. It's non-adjacent amino acids. Think about what I'm saying, non-adjacent. That means they're not right next to one another but they are attracted to one another through hydrogen bonding. And these are the two main ways that non-adjacent amino acids can attract to one another through hydrogen bonding. They form these pleated sheets or these helices. A helix is a spiral. Imagine, if you will, <clears throat> thousands of these amino acids starting to interact with one another and forming sheets and helices and in multiple ways and then a sheet here might interact with a helix over here and a helix here could get attracted to a helix over there and then a sheet there and a helix here and so again and again these proteins fold up into next and, uh, and more complicated levels of structure. So we start with primary. Primary means first. We go to secondary. Secondary means second of course. Tertiary, you think about tertiary, that'll be third. And then quaternary is the fourth level of organization. And you see how this tertiary structure here has this beige outline. So here it is again, right? Here's that beige outline tertiary structure. But this tertiary structure protein or polypeptide is interacting with this one and this one and this one. And so altogether now we have probably four separate polypeptides acting as one whole complete structural protein. And what order these are in determine how they fold up or spiral and how these fold up and spiral determine how they uh, um, glob on to themselves and form this shape. And this shape determines whether or not they can interact with other polypeptides. And it's the final shape of this protein that's really going to determine whether or not it works. So let's talk about what proteins do. That means their function. Okay, There's five main things we want to talk about here. We're going to talk about structure and um, hormones, which are chemical signaling molecules, movement, right, like literally moving around, transport materials through and around um, cells and through organisms' bodies, and then something called an enzyme. So let's go through this. <clears throat> Proteins form major structural parts of the bodies of organisms. If you look in the mirror, um, what you're seeing mostly is protein or the result of the action of protein. Uh, your skin and the muscles underneath your skin, when you're looking at yourself in the mirror, um, have a lot of collagen in it. Uh, collagen and elastin are very important proteins for how cells uh, group with one another and form the shape of your body structure. Connective tissue. When I talk about connective tissue, or when anybody talks about connective tissue, we're talking about how bones connect to bones through um, what we call ligaments and how muscles connect to bones uh, in uh, what we call tendons. Keratin is a really key protein in your body structure. See this stuff right here, this hair? I know I don't have much of it right in this region here. And my fingernails? That's called keratin. <coughs> Let's talk about hormones. Hormones, of course, are molecules that are made by one organ system usually to signal another organ system to do something. Hormones can regulate your body functions. They might signal some type of developmental cycle or um, other biological functions that occur in your body or other organisms. Movement. The fact that I can move um, is dependent on protein action. And you know what happens is your muscles are connected to your bones, and when your muscles shorten, what that does is it makes your bones move relative to one another. So. Protein is a really, really important part of how your muscle cells actually get shorter. And we'll um, talk a little bit more about that if we have some time this year. 
transport. When we talk about transport, this could be getting things into or out of cells. Sometimes big structures or structures that don't want to go through a, a um, fossil lipid bilayer of a cell membrane might need to travel through a special tunnel made by a protein. And there are some proteins that actually actively move materials into or out of cells. And we call those transport membrane proteins. <clears throat> Getting oxygen into and out of your body is really dependent on a particular type of protein that's found in your red blood cells. Hemoglobin is a really important protein that uh, binds O2 molecules to it. And so there's a lot of hemoglobin in red blood cells and your red blood cells act as oxygen delivery uh, me mechanisms to get bl uh, blood and oxygen with your blood all around your body. Enzymes are a particular class of proteins that help chemical reactions occur. Um, they act as catalysts, and what catalysts do is they lower the amount of activation energy that's required to get a chemical reaction to go, and catalysts are absolutely critical for chemical reactions to happen quickly so life can be sustainable. <clears throat> so, do you remember how I was talking a slide ago about how the shape of a protein is really critical for how well or how it doesn't function in some situations? When a protein loses its shape, we call that denaturing. Any protein can lose its shape, and there's a variety of reasons why it can lose its shape. Uh, you might change the pH, maybe pH goes too low, situations get too acidic, or pH goes too high, which means too basic. If you change temperature, too low or too high, that can change how a protein works or doesn't work. Think about cooking your food. You cook your food, um, if you think about cooking any type of meat, um, if you like steak or um, hamburgers, that's really just cut up muscle from a cow, and when you cook it, it changes color, it's not as tough, it's easier to chew and easier to digest. So the cooking actually partially denatures those proteins to make them more easily um, digestible in your digestive system. <clears throat> so the shape is lost when a protein is denatured and so the function is also lost. Now in some situations, um, if the original conditions return, the shape of a protein might also return. There's four main things that create the shape of a protein. And of course, it's all dependent on the order of what amino acids. So if you look at this diagram, this purplish, bluish ribbon here, that represents these amino acids all linked up in a row. Okay, And what you see here are some particular side chains that are shown. We've already talked a little bit about hydrogen bonding, how a partial positive area here could be attracted to a partially negative area here. And what you're seeing is an amino acid here near the beginning of this polypeptide is attracted through hydrogen bonding to another amino acid down here, which is certainly not right next to it in the sequence. Another type of interaction that can occur with side chains of amino acids is what we call a hydrophobic interaction. Look at all these molecules here, or all these atoms. This is carbons bonded to carbon and carbons bonded to hydrogen. Those are nonpolar bonds. And it, you know a lot of the bonds in a protein are going to be polar bonds. So if you get an area of a protein that's nonpolar, what will happen is this particular area will try to group away from the watery living environment that it's found in. <clears throat> Here's two sulfurs. All right. Now this word di, or this prefix di, means two. And so sometimes you can get a sulfur actually covalently bonding to another sulfur. We call that a disulfide bridge. This side chain is from an amino acid here, and this side chain is from an amino acid over here. So again, non-adjacent in the primary sequence, amino acids being attracted to one another and forming the shape of the protein. And here's the fourth and final type of interaction that I'm going to talk about, and that's when we get an ionic bond. So if we get a positive, an actual positive charge, and an actual negative charge on non-adjacent amino acids, as you see here and here, down here, this is a true ionic bond that can occur between non-adjacent amino acids in a polypeptide. So that's it. Uh, that's the end of your screencast five from Organic Chemistry. 
all about proteins and amino acids and how proteins fold up to have particular shapes and particular functions. Bye, everybody.